You're listening to New Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Pedro. Dash is poised to be number one. Token sale, triumph, and turbulence, and the prices, oh my. All this and more on episode 212 here on Wednesday, June 28th, 2017. In the traditional markets, we have gold down to $1,248. Silver's down to $16.78. Oil is up slightly to $44.88. And the Dow is up to 21,400. 54 points in the 30 year treasury treasury is the yield of it is slightly up to 2.78 percent excellent and in the crypto markets bitcoin is up to 2583 like uh 2583 of course litecoin is up to 43 dollars and 47 cents ethereum is down to 330 dollars and dash is up to 184 dollars just a reminder that you can tune in to Neocash Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, and more. Well, yeah. there's so much to talk about. We, uh, we we should just get right into it, Darren. And we've got Dash News right yeah, off the gate. Yeah, so Dash News. So there's uh, something I definitely want to talk about a little bit, although it's it's not the most exciting thing. we got the exciting thing coming up in a little bit. Um, and that's an open letter from Evan and Ryan. That's uh, Evan Duffield and Ryan Taylor uh, about Dash marketing strategy. And Evan Evan Duffield is the basically the founder of Darkcoin, which became Dash. And uh, Ryan Taylor is called the CEO of Dash. He's basically uh, heading the uh, core team and and uh, just managing it. So uh, the the letter that uh, Ryan wrote it, it expresses concerns. Um, over potential legal issues that token sales and initial coin offerings may suffer. And uh, Evan and Ryan do not wish to market Dash as an investment. They, uh, they Basically, the, the letter is saying that they, when you market, if, if people are going to get paid by the network to market Dash, they're encouraging them. They can't force them because of the way crypto works, but they're encouraging them to uh, not market Dash as something that may be worth more in the future. They would prefer that people talk about what it can be used for, how it's going to be used, how it's going to solve some problems that these other cryptos are running into. And uh, so basically, he just wants to market the fundamentals and stay away from the hype. Yeah, and this is really cool because this is a time of a lot of hype. And as we mentioned in the tease of the show, the token sales have caused a lot of issues. Now, and on the same subject, uh, we, we actually have a, a blog from Open Bazaar that talks about why they didn't want to do a token sale, why an Open Bazaar token doesn't exist. And yeah. they go into very real, rational reasons why they don't have a token, because yeah. they don't need a token. Yeah, they don't need a token, and there were, virt- there were um, venture capitalists that are, wa- that are actually in the wings of that project and funding it. So, I mean, I, I know... Uh, people employed by it, like Chris Pacia, who we've interviewed, uh, that uh, are the direct beneficiary of that venture funding. That's right. So it's it's you know it's good to see these uh, new startups. Of course, Dash is a little bit older than uh, Open Bazaar, but it's good to see a very rational and reasonable approach to not only marketing strategy, but also the fact that you don't need to jump on the token train. Uh, because you know that it's there's good and bad with it, but right, and, and that's a great point. It, you shouldn't jump on the token train just for the purpose of saying, "Hey, we have a token." I mean, the the reason you have a token is because there's a, a technical need. Um, so if you feel that your you know your business project doesn't need that, uh, I'm I'm glad to see that you know Dash and you know Open Bazaar coming out with that. Yeah. Statement. Well, Dash, I mean, there's there's more to talk about, and we want to get to this one too, Darren. Yeah, Big so, news. So much, uh, most of my morning and afternoon were uh, d- devoted to this topic, although uh, a little bit more detailed than uh, what, uh, what I'll be saying here. So uh, the, the, this week, uh, Evan came out with uh, what he's calling a roadmap, which outlined, which outlined a scaling timeline. Um, without going into too much details, there are plans to scale to two megabytes by the end of the year. This means that Dash will handle eight times the network traffic of Bitcoin when, when that gets live on net. Right now, they can handle four times as much as Bitcoin. Uh, longer term plans are to scale to 20 megabytes with an eye on 400 megabytes. And I was running the numbers uh, earlier uh, just because I was interested. And so basically, 400 megabytes could support one half, one and a half transactions for every man, woman, and baby in America. Wow. That's good. So, um, I mean, just America. I mean, you want these uh, crypto things to be global if you can do it. But I I think this is a a pretty good 
pretty good and measured approach to scaling. Um, Evan outlined that he expects nodes to run specialized hardware to be able to scale to that level. So you, as the listeners may know, Dash is run on a two-tier network where they have the master nodes that are actually compensated for running, and then the uh, the uh, other nodes, which is like the first tier, and then there's going to be a third tier, which is the simplified payment verification. And they're going to actually develop the master nodes to support that simplified payment ver- verification in a fairly decentralized way. Okay. It's not as decentralized as running a node, but it's basically you query 10 different nodes, and if they come to a, a pretty good agreement on what the thing is, then you get a result on what your query was. So um, so uh, this this is pretty exciting. It is. Um, I mean, there's a lot more in this roadmap, and there are things that I'm still learning about and I can't really explain just yet. But it's really, like, to see where Dash has come to, right. and to see where they're at and to see where they're going, I mean, it, it, like I said in the beginning, I think Dash is poised to be number and, one, not in the price. I'm not talking about if you were gamble with Dash and the price. I'm talking about the utility and the value that the coin and, offers. And it's pretty interesting to read because Evan is just basically assuming that nodes are going to go through the process that the miners went through. Now you have compensated nodes. You're going to see uh, people running VPSs that have GPUs that can do all the parallel processing of all the transactions in a block and and get, do a quick verification. And then he actually expects, you, basically, as they go above 20 megabytes, he expects there actually to be uh, products available that have an ASIC attached to it that can. Uh, and the ASIC is not needed for mining, but. Uh, also, uh, this would be an a like a shot fifty two two fifty six ASIC because the transactions need to do a hash to verify them. So, so you you basically need to do those hashes real quick. That's kind of the bottleneck on the processor right there. So, Darren, a quick question. Uh, I like that they're looking to scale to two megabyte by the end of the year, and you know, adding eight times the capacity is great. Um, after that, two megabytes um, would it would it jump up one megabyte or? Up to would it just double every time that it goes well, up? Um, it, it's it's not very clear. There is some discussion about that right now. I, I think what was in the public document was twenty, but it could it could go in smaller steps, especially if this, uh, especially if we uh, if there's these uh, two megabytes rolled out and it goes very smoothly. Uh, then now, we'll now to just be, do the same thing again. Now, to be clear, Dash doesn't have uh, full blocks at the moment. They don't, typically don't have full blocks. And so we're not talking right. about how just because they scale the network, it doesn't mean that they need it right now. Now, that's, this is something that's certainly that true. They'll, they'll need in the future. At the moment, they can already handle four mm-hmm. times what Bitcoin can handle. But, so, uh, you know, it's sort of like... When, well, when, w- what this means is that they don't need to worry about scaling for a while. Exactly, they, they go to two megabytes. You yeah. know, uh, you know, increase the 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 bandwidth eight times on the network, and, and, and was, then focus on other things. And JJ, I ran the numbers on this, and like if you just look at the Dash transactions, it went up fivefold in the last four months. Wow. Okay, and I just assumed it, an exponential. Uh, rise similar to that five fold in four months that has them running into their cap um in in about uh august of next year well one thing that that we don't talk about and i don't think it's mentioned enough about dash and then we'll move on to other things of course there's so much to talk about but the scarcity that's involved with dash when you have more than half of the supply the current supply locked up in master nodes you you actually aren't i don't think you're seeing that in the price i don't think you're seeing the scarcity that's there because it doesn't have the velocity of you know the transaction throughput yet but i think once that transaction throughput is hit then that scarcity starts to take effect yeah and it, i think that's when you start to see uh i mean a, a i mean a different way of looking at dash but right now dash is it seems in with this latest dip and this the little crash that we'll talk about later Dash came down a little bit like everything else, but yeah. it has been far more stable as far as the price. Now, if that's what you're concerned about is the price of Dash, then that's one data point. But I, you know, the fact that they have instant verification, the instant send, yeah. is, is, I think, the biggest thing they have going for them right now. And, and the fact that they're going to be integrating with Tor to make that private send even more anonymous... Uh, we'll just add functionality. Well, well I mean, I, I watched the Bitcoin network and they were like, we're going to, well, you know, Gavin was in there at some point and Gavin was like, we're going to scale when we need to. We're going to scale when we need to. We're going to scale when we need to. Right. 
And so with the Dash people, they said, hey, we've voted, and yes, we voted to scale. And then the developers started saying, we're going to scale when we need to. We're going to scale when we need to. We're going to scale. And so it seemed like the same story. So by actually upgrading, they're like, no, we're serious. We're going to do it. And and the whole thing about crypto is, is you don't have to rely on a, on a trust. You don't have to rely on trusting a third party. And by the developers saying, we'll do it when we need it, we'll do it when we need it, the users are trusting the developers that they'll do it when they need it. Right. So if they just do it, then you don't need to trust them. It's just done, and you're running the code that's going to do it. Yeah. So there you go. I, I mean, I, I've been impressed with, with Dash lately. They seem to be doing everything I want to see the Bitcoin teams do. So um, I'm really happy to see you know, the, uh, yeah. this this and, latest news on their plan for the next few months. And I, I guess I can tell you from behind the curtain that they're, they're just a, such a great team to work with. I I mean, we, we discussed... That's right, because Darren, you, you started work, working yeah, on Dash? Yeah, I started working with... We, start, we discuss things, and we say, hey, this is my idea, or this is what I want to do, this is what I want to do. Sometimes they're not the same, but, you know, usually we can come to an agreement within an hour or half an hour, you know, and uh, it's not like this ongoing debate and all this. It's just like, this will work, that will work. Okay, do one. They both work. <laughs> wow. So that's good. All right. Well, moving on, we've got to talk about this last week. Uh, the network, the Ethereum network, especially suffered greatly under the congestion as status raised more than $10 million. The token sale quickly sold out, but the network was feeling the effects for days. Thousands of high gas fee transactions filled the network during the token sale. Those transactions were still filling filling blocks hours after the sale was uh, over destined to be rejected. All the while, normal transactions were be being put on a lower list, uh, lower on the list in favor of the more lucrative fees. Claims are being made that there was foul play by a couple mining pools. F2 Pool has been accused of participating in the token sale, ensuring that their own transactions made into blocks while others did not. I've not yet been able to confirm this, but it brings up an important topic. Yeah, that's a that's basically an attack on the network. Mining pools acting as whales during a, during a token sale while ensuring that their contribution makes it in the block while others do not. What are the ethical implications? And what if only mining pools were able to buy up all the tokens in one block? Well, yeah. then that defeats the purpose of, you know, being able to issue, you know, I don't want to say securities, but tokens. Uh, in a in a fair way that's open to the public, and that's one of the things I really like about crypto is that we can bypass the the corrupt way that IPOs are done uh, on Wall Street. Uh, in in my opinion, when when Wall Street, you know, when somebody goes to Wall Street saying I'm going to go public, and only the big houses have access to the pre IPO price, then in in my book that's corruption because I can't get in on that. Uh, and and it's sad to see that you know you have it's great that there's excitement around all these new ways to fund new projects, and and, and the, you know it, it appears that the, the price goes up very high, so everyone is interested in doing this. So then you have a token sale, and it kicks off you know at, on this minute, and the network is just overwhelmed. So I don't know what ways you know what can you do with smart contracts? Maybe we need Metropolis. Uh, and some of its features to be able to do it. But how can we still keep the fairness that the little guy can get in on these sales without, you know, crushing the network? I, I think a lot of these token sales might not end very well uh, in the long run. And so uh, maybe if the little guy didn't get in, maybe it's not so bad. But I imagine if F2 Pool was doing some hanky-panky like this, I imagine they're going to sell at the first chance they get. Because if they're the only people that have opportunity to buy, and, and as you can see, there was a severe demand just from the, the network traffic, um, th then they can just pretty much turn them over, sell them like a double or That's what a lot of whales are doing with yeah. these token sales is you'll see these these big buys, and then as soon as the token is tradable on the market, it is selling for two or three or four times so, the, the, the ICO price. So this is kind of akin to scalping the small guy or something like that, like uh, as far as ticket scalping or something like sure. that. Sure. Yeah, you're first in token line. Token scalping. You get to the, the head of the line, and you, you plop down, a, you know, you 50,000 Ether. And, you know, that's, that's a big commitment. But that wasn't just all that happened this week. So this congestion happened, causing a lot of problems in the network. But then there was two other things that happened. One that I didn't realize until before when we were doing the show prep, but there were rumors that Vitalik died at some point, right? Yeah, over this uh, week or this weekend, there's rumor that Vitalik died. And apparently it took a couple of days before Vitalik knew that people were saying he was dead. Wow. And so he, uh, he, he basically put a picture up on his Twitter where he had zombie paint on, 
and uh, he had the uh, basically the hash of the of a recent Ethereum block. So, and uh, the Coinbase's GDAX crash. So there was what a thirty three million dollar uh, sell order from Ethereum into U.S. dollars that went through GDAX. And now this is a very interesting area, and this is where perhaps my opinion might differ from what you will hear in other news organizations. But I don't think that this situation should be given as much credit as the the panic sellers gave it. Just because GDAX is selling off. Now, now the thing is, is that GDAX is not only an exchange in the sense of they have an exchange and a trading platform where people can put buy and sell orders and things like that, and margin orders as well. But mm-hmm. they also have the retail side of Coinbase. So you you have this opportunity for someone to connect a legacy bank account to their Coinbase account and then make massive fiat moves into their because it, especially if they were someone who doesn't care whether they if if I'm not speculating as to who it is and nor I'm not trying to alight any conspiracy theories but I'm just saying that if a person doesn't really care about whether they make money or lose money they can really affect the the Coinbase and GDAX price I don't think GDAX should have that much power over the entire world's Ethereum price. And I don't think that the, the panic selling that occurred is, is, is valid, really. I think, I think this is, this is not, not a conspiracy. I think this is, is more like a, a, poor, a poor situation of, of Coinbase having GDAX and all this connected together and allowing something like, like for example, Poliniex doesn't have fiat. And there are a lot of other exchanges that don't have fiat. And they're not going to have these massive, massive problems necessarily unless someone's moving crypto. But the, ne- the moment you connect a fiat account or a bank account to a crypto, then you're going to have people moving massive sums of money. And the fiat end of things, it doesn't matter because how many trillions of dollars are in circulation, right? And right. how many different currencies and trillions of dollars right. are in circulation, so one one of the subreddits I I stay on top of is uh, ETH Trader and I you know every time that there's this you know ICO and you know it slows down the network and or or the price dips a lot people go on this subreddit and say well it just seems that every time the price takes a massive dip that Coinbase is down right right when I want to make some purchases yeah. Coinbase is down I've noticed I, that too I want to move money from I want to do a wire transfer and buy some cheap Ether and, you know, Coinbase is down. Now, I personally don't think that they're doing this on purpose. Coinbase is a fiduciary. You know, they're regulated. Um, you know, so people will go to jail if, if, if this is what they're doing. So I, I, I don't think this is what they're doing. But it does show that Coinbase is not prepared right. for, the, for this massive right. influx well, of... Pedro, you, they are doing this. They are going down. But when you say this is not what they're doing, you mean that they're not intentionally they're, doing it. They're not intentionally bringing it. So the, the, the challenge is, is Coinbase, when the price dips, does this massive dip, do they go down so that they can buy the cheap coins and their users cannot? So, so that, was the, you know, that was the speculation. And I don't believe that to be true. I just think their systems are overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, it's, it's, and you know, there, there is the growing pains of all the influx of traders, and we have, we've a few weeks ago we mentioned how Coinbase had record numbers of signups, and a, a bunch of other exchanges had the same thing. Uh, but the, you know, the, the point is, is it's like that that sale because it was because of that connection, they were able to trigger all these margin margin calls, right? And then Coinbase comes out afterwards. Initially, Coinbase came out and said, it's your fault. You made those margin or you eat it. And the, the initial blog post was like tough love. And then a day or two later, they come out with, uh, okay, we're going to, everybody that, that their margin call got called and you lost out, we're going to compensate you what you lost and everything will be cool. But any trades that were made are still going to happen. And so like, it's sort of like, then the computer is like, oh, cool. Well, Coinbase thinks a lot. But you know what, Coinbase, you should have never let this happen in the first place. I well, think the fault lies with you and the way you have well, your system set up. Short, what you're describing is a short squeeze where you have basically one short position, or it's a long squeeze, I guess. You have a, a um, um, well, anyway, you have one short sc- position, and it, then, then there's a margin call that triggers buying. So I guess it would be a long squeeze. Whether it's it incompetence, yeah, poor anyway. design, or any number of other human errors. I'm not saying that they're, 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 they're malif- um, they have malice in, intent. I'm not saying that. 
I'm just saying that I think it's their fault, and they they should be owning up to this. They, they might want to consider um, in, in, their margin requirements or something, make them a little bit higher. I don't or think the, like the 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 caps should be really paying that much power. They shouldn't shouldn't be weighting Coinbase as heavily. I, That's what I think. I think pers- Coinbase should be weighted half as much as it is. I personally have stayed away from all this margin trading and anyone I, that margin I think trades, that's a smart idea. Yeah, any of these margin trading places, I think should be should be underweighted when it comes to how they affect the actual price. And I if mean, they if you want if you want a place where ether sells for nothing, then cool, you go to that place. I, I you know th- what I'm saying? I think it's kind of good that the margins out there because that can help even out the the highs and the lows, but we're really not seeing that. We're not seeing these highs and lows. And and one reason I don't want to do anything with margin trading with crypto is because it's already so vol- volatile. Right. Right. So it's already so such a volatile thing. Why would you want to leverage that? You know, if it's doubling overnight with the if the underlying assets are doubling overnight or doubling in a month, why do you need to leverage that? You know, and if it halves overnight, you definitely don't want to leverage that, right? And and that's that's the way this stuff goes. It goes up and down. So But here's the here's the big issue, and this is where I'll leave, but Pedro has something to add, is that the the victims of Coinbase's uh whatever issue situation aren't all on Coinbase. They're not all on GDAX, and they're not all going to be made whole by Coinbase's efforts. So so, so what happened at Coinbase impacts others? Yeah, right. oh. exactly. It's, it's, that's, that's exactly my point. So uh, back, uh, back June 21st, last week, uh, Brian Armstrong, the, the CEO at Coinbase, uh, at blog.coinbase.com, came out with a blog post about how they're investing in the fundamentals for Q3. So what this means is um, operational excellence, scaling and providing a better customer experience. So they point they they break out the following points, rebuilding pieces of their back end, focusing on uptime and reliability. Yeah, let's let's highlight that one. Scaling customer support and providing faster response times, improving the customer experience, hiring and onboarding a lot more people and training more managers. So they do have a whole bunch of uh jobs posted recently. So I'm hoping that they're taking the, you know, the the money that they're making and investing in their fundamentals to you know, to become something that doesn't go down when everyone wants to buy. Well, rather than, I mean, and rather than letting their customers wallow in uncertainty, if they can't serve that the number of customers at this given point in time, they need to turn customers away. And I know this is bad for business, but it's bad for the customer if you don't. So moving on, we have more to talk about. Uh, the, and we're talking about another ICO. Now this one also. <laughs> hey, hey uh, JJ, yes. that, what you just said, Yeah, I think Bitcoin could have taken that advice. Right. <laughs> So 10x, uh, we've had we had the interview with Dr. Julian Haas about 10x tops their goal of 200,000 ether in seven minutes. That's right. Between the pre-sale and the public sale, the 10x team reached their ultimate funding amount at seven minutes in time. The token sale was seemingly more like drag races than anything. And the sale happened quickly, but the news must not have reached uh, as many because attempts to contribute persisted for a while. And the network, of course. I, in fact, I remember seeing a uh, Facebook post from 10, 10x being like, "Listen, the token sale's been over for a while. Stop sending ether." <laughs> so, I, I, you know, there may be another mechanism built in where where people, the their wallet just knows, okay, this token, this contract is no longer valid. Maybe if there there was some trigger that said this contract is valid I mean, or invalid, better programming could probably help. But uh... well, that was the big complaint about the status was that the the, the token was the sale contract wasn't uh, programmed very well. But moving on, we have more to talk about. So last week, Darren and Pedro were at Pork Fest up in Lancaster, New Hampshire. And instead of a regular episode, I published two bonus episodes. The first one was an interview with David Werba from Musiconomy. The MusicCoin team has a finished product that works, and they are looking to fast-forward development with an initial token offering. The new platform, Musiconomy, aims to be a one-stop shop for artists where they can share music, sell tickets to shows, and even handle digital rights management and royalties. The second episode featured a return of Matt Simon. Matt is an expert marijuana policy analyst, and he joined me to talk about cannabis-related cryptocurrencies, Potcoin, and the Tokes platform. We discussed the banking issues legal cannabis businesses are facing and how crypto may solve their problem. So uh, how was Porkfest, guys? Oh, it it was fun. I I believe I bought some soap with with Dash, and I bought uh, a Trezor with Dash. Now, Porkfest is typically a pay, a place where you where alt coins or alt, or alt anything. It doesn't even matter as long as it's not fiat. Basically, yeah. I mean, it's silver, traded. gold, you know, yeah, the barter, crypto, yeah. barter, yeah. 
So, and crypto made a big splash uh, a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, actually. Oh, yeah. It was so much fun. Like, I remember one year, crypto, nobody was using it. Then the next year, uh, and when I say crypto, Bitcoin is basically the only one back then. Uh, then the next year, everybody was all over Bitcoin, using it all the time and all this. And this year, it was kind of more somber. Like, you, you know, people used it, but not that you didn't see it as much. So. Was there any issues with uh, connectivity and well, Wi-Fi? Um, other than being in a campground, uh, <laughs> yes, there were issues that with connectivity, as you might expect in a campground that's right. kind of remote. But so, so there was a Wi-Fi node sponsored by uh, Swarm City. There, um, so yeah. if you if you really needed you know, uh, internet access, you could go near that and, and get it. So how many how many crypto-related uh, vendors or, or sites were there? Oh, there were a few. There was, uh, um, let's see, there was a, one that was just promoting crypto, basically just guy with a sign that's saying, yeah, I like crypto. There was one that was kind of weird. Um, and, of course, I'm not advising to buy or sell anything, but there was somebody there that was talking about these bit beans. And I, I have no idea what they are, except they just, they sound a lot like Bitcoin. I, I looked at my coin me wallet and I'm like, these, you know, BitBeans aren't even listed here. I mean, I don't understand why somebody's advertising <laughs> something that doesn't. And the, and apparently the lead developer was in the campsite there and he, but he was away while I was asking him questions. Uh, so, so I, I have no idea what that's about, but that was kind well, of interesting. Well, I, I, so every park fest, uh, there are these, uh, two girls, you know, maybe pre preteens that go around selling things that they <clears throat> print out on a 3D printer for crypto. Um, so a lot of them are, you know, maybe a Bitcoin symbol with a magnet or other things. So uh, I see them every year. Um, they're smart. I hope they're holding all their crypto. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then there was also Swarm City there. Yeah, Swarm City had basically a hospitality booth or whatever. Was Open Bazaar there? Uh, no, no, other than Chris Pacey, it was right. There. Well, <laughs> he's probably on vacation. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the um, yes, I would say that's probably the, the keynote. The keynote speaker was our favorite CEO, Patrick Byrne of uh, Overstock.com. Wow. Um, and if you remember, Overstock.com was the first major online retailer to accept uh, Bitcoin. And he also has a, a T0 um, yep. blockchain where he got SEC approval to issue more Overstock.com stock. First company to ever do it on a, on a blockchain. So uh, he gave his keynote in a Bitcoin shirt nice. underneath the jacket. Yeah. So, yeah. And Chris Pacey did give a talk, but although, uh, although I was too busy making a, a calculator on a spreadsheet for the Dash team to... to be able to attend Chris's talk. Oh, no. Wow, it sounds like a great pork fest and a lot of different crypto folks there enjoying the festivities. Um, so I've got a analogy I want to share with you as I'm, as I'm in an ongoing effort to better explain digital currencies to our listeners. I want to relate the progression and development of the different blockchains to the history and evolution of the modern automobile. If we look at the Model T, launched in 1908 as the tipping point of mass adoption success, Bitcoin is more like an early gas-powered tractor, in fact, a precursor to the automobile with decades of development left before it reaches the Model T stage. The other cryptos uh, have come along and improved and innovated, but would still be prior to the Model T as cars. The space between the Model T and the new self-driving Tesla is massive, with over 100 years of human innovation. The good news is that the digital medium has allowed the evolution to speed along, not at the speed of a human hand, but at the speed of electricity. Dash is perhaps the closest crypto to the Model T point, but that is still a year or more away. Of course, Dash would be a car that could teleport to its de destination and turn invisible, so that's a nice feature to have. Ethereum wouldn't be a car, but rather a car radio that evolves into the internet. It, also, uh, it is also in the save development trough that all great ideas must climb out of, I could go on and on, but I need to get to an important point. If crypto is not yet at the Model T point, then the space is far from the airbags, crumple zones, seatbelts, or really any safety features. No AC, no power windows, or even power steering. Each and every person who puts money into crypto must understand and accept that this space is dangerous, raw, and uncertain. The protocol is absolute and unforgiving. The network will have problems. There will be bugs. There will be security holes. Attackers will find exploits. People will lose money through some glitch or fat finger. Your security is your responsibility. The light at the end of the tunnel is also uh, the light at the end of the tunnel is the evolution of mankind. 
those that travel through, the, through this darkness will not just witness the evolution, they will have lived it and likely have the scars to prove it. So that's a warning to traders and investors very, and gamblers. Some deep very thoughts, good. JJ. Yes, I, I, I very much like that analogy. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm actually a little bit bummed that nobody's down on Dash today because I want to kind of have a debate and stuff like that. But anyway, and, and we kind of have just come to these. We, we have our show notes, but we, are, we allow each other to come to our own conclusions and stuff like that. So I, I'm really surprised at uh, uh, what's happening uh, this this show, but anyway, so uh, the Lightning Network is cumbersome and won't really work. What the Lightning so, Network? Won't, what what will Segwit, Darren? So, uh, well, uh, I, I've been thinking about the Segwit too, and the thing about Segwit is it actually makes a really complicated transaction, which maybe a, a really high level businessman or a high level technical person might use. It really makes that a cheaper transaction than uh, than somebody is just trying to use Bitcoin. So basically, Bitcoin is going towards a model that's pricing out the everyday person. For a decentralized network, you can't you can't price out the everyday person. That's ridiculous. It's already pricing out the everyday person at four dollars a transaction, but it's it's even going for more bias towards people who do really complicated things and use a big part of the block to to people. Uh, it's subsidizing that as opposed to just p- letting people use it and having the person that needs more space pay for it. So, um, so SegWit has that problem. But on, but one of the reasons that they promote SegWit is to implement Lightning Network. Right. But Lightning Network, um, Randy uh, actually pointed this out to me because it was a really mathematical thing. But uh, uh, it, it, it was just explaining how the Lightning Network really won't work. Mathematically so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it will work. But if you're trying to make a payment between person A in America and person B in Brazil, and they didn't know each other before, and they're not, they don't have any social connections, they're going to have to go through a centralized intermediary, more or less, because they're just going to have to. And then um, with with... With uh, with the Lightning Network, for each intermediary you have, it basically ties up your money. So uh, basically, there's a capital cost there that most people won't be willing to make. They won't be willing to tie up their money just so they can use the network. Right. So um, well, this is talking about using the payment channels. And just for those that don't understand clearly, a payment channel would be, uh, say, that Darren and I wanted to transact on the Lightning Network, and we opened a payment channel, and both of us put two Bitcoin into this payment channel. Yeah, sure. And then we started to trade and did whatever we want, and eventually we want to resolve that channel. And right. then whatever Bitcoin, at the end of the day, whatever Bitcoin was Darren's would go to him, and whatever Bitcoin was mine would go to me, of the, the four right. Bitcoin available. But then there, you then there's one transaction to open the channel, one transaction to close the channel. Right. So if JJ and I don't make more than two or three transactions, make more than like three transactions, is really not worth it. No. So now the idea of the Lightning Network would be, let's say we have this payment channel between Darren and I, but we can interlink this payment channel with a another person that either Darren or I knows, and then that person can link a channel with someone they know, and this can go on and on and on, and conceivably it could go on forever. But the problem that arises is that, for one, you're, you're really relying on luck in that you have the right combination of contacts, and they have the right combination of contacts to get to your destination, in one, and two, you're also looking at sending and loaning loaning Bitcoin or crypto. So you're looking at, in order for me to send a payment across all of these individuals, I'm basically having them loan me their crypto. And then in, in because of that, I have to make sure I have the crypto here on, on hold so that it travels through the payment channel and everybody gets the right amount. But what the problem is, is that you're left with a lot of crypto sitting in reserve to cover your transactions. And that's, that's where the real issue lies, is that in order to do a lot of these transactions, you have to make sure that you can cover what's going on. Not only that you can cover what you have going on, but remember, other people are going to use your channel as well. Now, ha- hasn't Litecoin implemented this, or is it No, uh, they've only implemented different? SegWit. They have yet to implement the Lightning Network. So as far as I can tell, that might be going on in the testnet. I'm not certain because I don't really pay attention to Litecoin. Do you uh, know? Do you know if Litecoin is going to implement Lightning before Bitcoin? I, I well, don't. they're set to do. If um, I, I just, it's just a matter of labor. If the people that want to do Lightning Network are trying to get it out as soon as possible, they can work on Litecoin, and it would be more likely that they'll get it out. 
Because because what I'd like to see is this test, you know, basically tested out on Litecoin before anyone would think of doing it with Bitcoin. Well, that should right. I think it should. That makes port. so much sense, Pedro. I think it should pour. Well, okay, so. keeping so, my fingers crossed on that one. You, you could use a lightning. Uh, well, you could this, test out lightning on the test net on on light Litecoin. So this brings up an interesting point: is is getting to the Bitcoin discussion and talking about the user activated soft fork, and then the bit main response to that. Oh, because you use your user activated hard yeah. fork. <laughs> so okay, they're wor- doing all this work for something that won't really work in the end. For and, Segwit times and, two. <laughs> Segwit times two. Oh, and uh, that's I, what, it's it's, it's I, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to put together a special where I just it's just probably gonna be me the, and, and I just talk about the 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 wasteland survivor guide to <laughs> US UASF UAHF oh no and you, Bitcoin you sell your Bitcoin oh and buy my. something else or that's you know, probably this, the <laughs> we don't give advice to buy or sell but we 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 have to tell you that if you want to stick around in Bitcoin after August first you are seriously taking a gamble. That's about it. I, I think that's that's fair. A, that's, that's a fair very to honest warning, <laughs> and uh, you know. So, but anyway, it's it's great to have the show, and, and sorry we missed last week. I know I gotten some words from people that they wanted to hear our response to certain things. Well, we've given you in this episode those responses. So thank oh, you so much. Oh, there's one more feel good story, JJ. Awesome. So a teenager becomes a millionaire by buying Bitcoin with a thousand dollar gift. Wow. So that's our. Feel good story of the evening. So, JJ. so he, this teenager got a thousand dollar gift uh, several yep. years ago, and then he wanted to buy Bitcoin, and the parents were uh, supportive of that uh, decision, and so he bought Bitcoin, and now he's a millionaire. Yay! Good for him. Well, he 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 made a good gamble. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I th- really think gam- I'm really glad to hear you use the word gamble, JJ, because that's probably the most apt word to use. I think you know if you want to communicate in in today's society, you need to be very clear with with how you which words you choose in order to communicate. Yeah. And we've so. talked about how, especially for these uh, the coins, it's not really an investment. There's no capital expense that's being made. There's no product that's being produced. Sure. Some of the tokens. If they deliver, they'll they'll actually be pr- delivering a product. But uh, but with these coins on themselves, there is no real investment going on. It's just to kind of let's see what happens. That's right. And you will see what happens on the next episode of Neo Cash Radio. Tune in every Wednesday where we can talk about the future of money today. This is JJ, Darren, and Pedro for Neo Cash Radio. Tune in to neocashradio.com. dot